Awesome. Hi, I'm Ryan. This is my colleague, Lindsay. Hello. Uh, thank you for showing up to write the docs. I don't know about y'all, but um, whenever I get ready to kind of talk too loud, too, too quiet. Louder. Louder. All right, I can do that. Okay. Louder. So I don't know about you all, but whenever I get ready to do a conference talk, I get super stressed out. So I have skipped lunch, but <laughs> I believe that we are both coffeeed up. We are excited to share with you some things uh, that we have been working on. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about us. We work for uh, a project called Open News. We're a grant funded program and we work with newsrooms all over the country. So our community is journalists, and specifically the journalists who do their work through code. So we're talking about the developers, the designers, the data analysts in newsrooms who are really pushing the craft of storytelling and investigative journalism forward. Right, and Open News runs uh, several programs to support this community of people. We have a publication, which is called Source, where people write up how they've done a project and share knowledge with each other that way. Um, we also run a big conference called SourceCon once a year. It's a, it's a time for people to gather um, for an intensive period of a few days. But then we also run smaller events where people gather uh, throughout the year called convenings. And those happen several times a year. So we're here at Write the Docs because documentation is really a priority in all of our programs at Open News. So at our coding events, we're super upfront with participants. Great documentation, that needs to be goal number one. Um, at conferences and convenings that we participate in, it's a way for us to capture the conversations as they take place so that people get to learn from those even if they aren't there in person. And then internally on our own team, documentation is a way for us to write down not just how we do the things we do, but why. So for us, documentation, um, it helps us serve the community we work with in a lot of really specific ways. So not too long ago, we started thinking about how we might be able to use documentation to take a documentation project and help our community itself come together. So a lot of the newsrooms we talk to, they're all wrestling with similar problems. So what would it look like to create an event where we pick one of those problems and we focus on it, where documentation isn't just a thing that happens, but it's actually the goal of the event? And one of the great things about being a grant-funded program is we're actually supposed to run experiments like this. So in December, uh, we put together a small event to try some of these things out. And here's the spoiler, that kind of event can work really, really well. We spent two days in Washington, D.C. with about a dozen people writing and about a dozen more working remotely as readers and editors, and we made this. It's the field guide to open source in the newsroom. It's eight chapters, there's a ton of supporting material, and it fills a real need for our community. There's plenty of great open sourcing guides out there, but there weren't any that really attacked the problems that were specific to newsrooms. And we're thrilled with the field guide, but that's not exactly the story that we wanna share with you today. What we wanna do is tell you the story of how our event came together, how we actually wrote these docs, and how you can design an event to answer questions that your community has and make something amazing together. If you've been thinking about running a documentation sprint, what we wanna do is share a model that works. And if you already run events, we always love hearing how other people think about theirs. So hopefully we can share a few ideas that you find interesting too. So the title of our talk was, No Community Members Were Harmed in the Making of This Doc Sprint, because that's what we believe, that's, that's where a really successful event starts, is in thinking about humans. We want people to feel cared for, we want them to feel safe. And that starts with a code of conduct and clear expectations for everyone. We also want people to feel like they can be productive. They're volunteering something of real value to their community, so we wanna make sure they know that we really value them and their time. And so that gives us this underlying philosophy for planning something like a doc sprint. What can we do to remove questions before they even come up? How can we reduce people's stress? How do we let people focus on their best work? And so to make that happen, we have to expand how we as event organizers are looking at events. Our writing event itself lasted two days. It took a whole lot of facilitation work, and Lindsay's gonna tell you about a lot of that here in a few minutes. But we actually planned out our work over about three months. There was about eight to 10 weeks of lead up, then the in-person event itself, and then we set aside a few weeks for follow through afterward. And that sounds like a pretty long timeline, but I promise you, when you set your calendar early, that's the first step toward running a smooth event. So let's start with our checklist for getting an event off the ground. We actually have a GitHub uh, issue template for this. It's slightly more complicated than this slide, but we really do start with the basics, food and shelter. 
It seems obvious, but there's a big payoff when you sweat little details like this. Food is something it's really easy to overlook. You figure there's restaurants around, maybe you know a caterer, it's gonna take care of itself, but it absolutely doesn't. We've all been to events where meals and snacks are thoughtful and they're timed out well, and we've probably all been to events where the food feels more like it was an afterthought. And it is remarkable what kind of difference that makes and how well you can feel like you're able to do the thing you're there to do. So we start looking into food options early. What's nearby, what's walkable, who delivers? Do we have any dietary needs in our group? And if so, what restaurants can handle those? Where's our coffee gonna come from? That's like a checklist, like all on its own. So looking for the right workspace, that's another crucial thing. Basically what you're doing is inviting a bunch of people to lock themselves in a room for two days with strangers and work really hard. So having a human friendly space is one of the most important things you can do. So we look for a room that's big enough for people to break into small groups, but then also leaves room for people to split off and work quietly by themselves if that's what they need to do. We want walls and we want windows or we want whiteboards where we can put up post-its because we use a ton of post-it notes. You want a place that lets you bring in snacks, bring in coffee, but the big thing is you want natural light if you can get it. It makes a huge difference when you don't have fluorescence but instead you have some nice big windows. And then there's hotel, that's also something that needs some early thinking. If you're bringing in people from out of town, you wanna to get a handle on what's available, uh, how spendy it's gonna be. You might not wanna land in a city where there's some big festival, big event that's gonna drop a ton of people in the same downtown where, where you're gonna be working. So those two places, hotel and workspace, that's where your participants are gonna spend most of their time. So if you nail down great spaces early on, it goes a long way toward reducing anxiety about participating. And again, that is our whole goal here. We wanna take away anxiety about basic needs. Food, shelter, coffee. When you put real <laughs> thought into basics, you free up everyone's brain to actually think about the thing they're there to do. So the next thing on our checklist is to let people know that we're gonna take care of them. And so another thing we start into early is our communications with participants. The communication pattern that we found to be most helpful is to give updates every week or two, and we stay relentlessly focused on outcomes. What can we be thinking about right now to make sure that our event is as productive as it can be? We keep our emails really focused and really short, and one of the reasons we can do that is because we always point back to a reference document that contains all the facts about participation. We just use a shared Google Doc for this, but it's super helpful. So here's what ours covers. We list a couple paragraphs on what the event's about, something that's suitable for sharing with your boss or with people that you're working with. We have a loose schedule for the event itself. Again, we wanna reduce stress, so we don't want anybody wondering, what time am I supposed to show up? When's there gonna be food? We list the address and the details about workspace and hotel. We list all the participant names, and we give people a place to add their contact information. We really want people to feel like a cohort, and this is a place where we can really support getting started with that. We add any appropriate project links, any repos, transit tips, and then instructions about expenses. It's really a lot like something that you'd find on a conference website, like for Write the Docs here, but it's totally worth taking the time to put together that document, even if you're just working for a dozen people. It's this great signal, and it says, hey, we're thinking a lot about how to make this event good for you. And when you plan to share that document plenty early, it makes sure that you get on that logistics checklist uh, in a good amount of time. Now, I mentioned expenses because that's one more thing that we try to do, is make sure travel expenses don't come out of people's pockets. And we have some program funding set aside for it, but if we didn't, we would absolutely look for sponsorship there. Um, it's not always possible. It's maybe not even super necessary if you're working just with local folks, but it is a really, really helpful thing to say, hey, you and your organization, you're volunteering a lot of time and expertise here, so we're gonna pick up the costs for this project. And when you can do that, it really expands the pool of people in your community who are actually able to participate. All right, so that's kind of the overview of our basic checklist to get moving on an event, starting to think about human needs eight to 10 weeks ahead of time. Uh, but for this particular doc sprint, we also had some extra homework. We had three big questions we felt like we needed to answer. First, is this even a good idea? We felt like there was this need for this resource, this guidebook on open sourcing newsroom software, but did people in our community feel the same way? Second, who is our audience? Are we making a thing for experts or for beginners? Are we writing for developers or for the people they work for? And third, is this even practical? 
We've done convenings before, but we had never done one where the output was documentation. So would two days be enough to make something great, or is that too ambitious? We didn't want to ask anybody else to volunteer their time until we felt like we had good answers to those questions. So we carved out a couple weeks to do some research, talking one-on-one -on -one with people in our community, people who were releasing software out of their newsrooms, people running into these same questions that we were wrestling with. And that helped us verify that, yes, there was a real appetite for this kind of resource. And not only that, there was this willingness to pitch in to make it happen. And it also helped us figure out our audience. Developers worried about two things, making the best technical decisions for their projects, and then navigating the conversations and the community around open source. And then to answer that third question, can we do meaningful work in a two-day sprint, we had to start doing some writing uh, on our own. We took what people told us about their projects, what went, what went well and what didn't go so well, and we started pulling out key themes into an outline. And then we took that outline apart and we put it back together again and did that a bunch of times, and finally we landed on a plan that felt big enough to do a lot of good, but defined enough that we could actually get through it with people in two days. And so that got us to this pretty tight description that was easy to share. What are the technical decisions and the cultural questions you face at three stages of a project? Before you start, while you're working on it, and after you've released it. So the couple weeks we spent on that process was super valuable. We ended up with this framework that felt opinionated, but not definitive. And so having that starting point also did something really important. It let us start having really productive conversations with our community about the event itself. When you're working in groups, there's always this risk of spinning your wheels. You spend a lot of time just deciding how to get started. And that's what we really wanted to skip, and we were very transparent about it. We told people, hey, we hope it makes things easier to have this outline to look at. Here's something to respond to. Now let's keep refining this together. We didn't want to be completely prescriptive. Our goal was to be just prescriptive enough to get things moving, and that totally worked. We made a few more decisions like that to kickstart the project, like what tools we'd use. We interviewed a lot of authors, we investigated some different platforms, we did a lot of reading about collaborative writing, and in, in the end, we kind of came back to a few simple tools that everybody are, already knew how to use. We used Google Docs for writing, because everyone has access, everyone knows how to use them. It's got built-in comments for editors. We used GitHub for data storage, so that we'd have pull requests and issues, and we could make good on this promise that this could be a, really, this could be a living resource. And then we use, we use Read the Docs, of course, because we wanted a really nice-looking, public-facing, reader-friendly version of our documentation. So having that outline and our tools already picked out, it gave everyone a head start. And it also gave us a really good story to tell. We got to share how much thought and work we had already put into this project, and that gave us a lot of credibility as we started talking with people about actually contributing as writers. And so for the planning phase, at least, that's the final piece of the puzzle. We really need writers. So one thing that's really important to us at Open News is that all of our events reflect the whole community that we serve. And we work at the intersection of journalism and tech, and there are definitely underrepresented groups in both those industries. So if we want to run an inclusive event, we have to put in the work. So for any event, we put a lot of effort into outreach to make sure we have participation across gender, across race, across size of organization, even across professional background when that makes sense. When you have a great mix of people in the room, it means you ask better questions and you come up with better answers. And whatever it is that you're making, it comes out way better. So for this doc sprint, we designed our recruitment process to get us to that goal. We started with a lot of one-on-one -on -one outreach, just to make sure we had that base of volunteers who could help us actually pull this thing off. Writers with open source experience who had stories to tell about their own code. People who were actually excited to lock themselves in a room for two days with strangers and do a lot of writing. And then a couple months before the event, we put out an open call for participation. We asked our community to help spread the word, because we always know there's this huge group of people out there, a lot of expertise, and we just haven't met them yet. And then between those two things, we pulled together a fantastic, diverse group of people to work with. About a dozen people to join us as writers, and a dozen more to work as remote readers and editors. And so this was a super exciting moment for us. We have everything coming together. We've got our food and shelter nailed down, our project outline exists, we have a group of volunteers, and we got going early enough so we still have several weeks to ease people into thinking about exactly what they want to write. We're checking in every week or two with questions to start capturing those writers' expertise, with prompts that we can turn into case studies later on when we're in the room. 
There's a whole lot of what can we be doing right now so that we get the most out of our time together. These final few weeks of lead up, they go really fast. And before you know it, you're all meeting up at the workspace and the event is really happening. Yes, at some point you realize that all your plans are coming together into exactly what Ryan said, a dozen strangers locked together in a room for two days. So this is the point at which you hope and you, you have to know that you picked the right people and uh, you picked the right space, honestly. I know this sounds crazy, but the space is so important because you're gonna be there for so long. So we totally lucked out, and this was a beautiful space that was um, available to us at the NPR headquarters in DC. And you can't really tell because this is just a stock photo of it, but this whole wall is like windows, and it's, it's enormous. So we had a t 12 people, but you could have easily fit 50 in here. Um, and, and the walls were, you could stick stuff on the walls. There weren't any rules about that. Yes. Um, and so then we come to the first day. And as Ryan said, we really worked hard to have a structured yet flexible process that really took into account people's needs and felt homey and felt like people were welcome there. So we have all these writers kind of arriving separately from however they've gotten to our space. We're, they're meeting and greeting. It kind of feels like the first day of school. It's kind of an electricity in the air because they know their goal is the same as our goal to, in two days, create a field guide that can be used by journalists and newsroom developers anywhere in the country or in the world. So it's a, it's a really cool goal, and it kind of has people amped up, but also a little like, what's gonna happen? Um, and so for us, as Ryan was saying about how we really wanna make people feel supported, one thing we did was we did a lot of work in advance. So it's kind of the difference between dropping everyone off in the middle of the woods and saying, hey, we're gonna build a cabin and just start logging trees, or giving them a beautiful space, um, lumber, nails, hammer, whatever you build a cabin with. I'm not a cabin builder, I don't know. But um, basically giving them the tools to succeed and not have to start from absolute scratch. So in our world, that meant that we had this outline that we walked in with so that people didn't have to start from a completely blank slate. Um, and each of those high-level points ended up becoming a chapter in our final field guide. So, now we get to the point where we're actually working together on this content. And uh, our strategy here was, again, with this structured yet flexible process, was to use a million Post-its. Um, and so each of those chapter headings became a piece of chart paper. So if you can imagine that room is now basically wallpapered with chart paper. And each of those papers has a heading up at the top. And these then become the buckets for the content. So if you want to replicate this in your own work, you would think about what these high-level chapter titles are. And then uh, as a group, collaboratively at your own table, you would uh, write what goes in those particular buckets. So people would individually create, generate all these ideas and these bits of content, and then categorize them based on what chapter they felt like they would go in. And that worked out awesomely because basically you can sit at your own little space and write and think, but then at the same time you're able to work together to kind of cluster and make sure you're hitting all the points of content that you know you want covered. So now we're getting to close to the point where writing actually happens, and this is the scary part, because we actually didn't know what it would look like if we were writing collaboratively in a room for two days, even though that was the entire point of the whole event. We'd never done it, we didn't know what that would be like, but we had an idea. We based it off of the idea of pair programming, which, um, as you probably know, is someone sits down and is sort of the driver of the process, and the other person is maybe typing, or vice versa, we thought, oh yeah, we can do that with writing, but actually then the day got closer and <laughs> we're like, someone was like, is this gonna be weird? Like someone's looking over your shoulder while you're writing and someone else in the organizing team was like, yeah, I was thinking that too, that that also might be weird. And so we got close to the event and realized, all right, we need to just kind of open that up and not think it's definitely gonna be like pair programming, pair writing could look like any number of things. 
And that is ultimately what we presented to our assembled group of a dozen people who were all looking at us expectantly for instructions as they're about to do this guidebook. Um, and so we also had this chapter template in there as well, which I think was really great because it kind of took away the tyranny of the blank page. If you've ever just started from nothing, you know that it's always easier to have anything other than nothing when you're about to start writing a document. Um, so yeah, they did it. <laughs> they actually started writing. Um, so some people wrote alone, some people wrote in trios, but basically you can see people, are, uh, pe people ripped down one of the chart papers that they wanted to work on. So it's like select your chapter and then they gathered in clusters and began working off of that chart paper, which was perfect because they were basically taking these collective ideas that had been generated and categorized and then turning them into content. Um, and yeah, I mean, it worked. It actually worked, which I don't know, we were super excited about. And as the organizers, we could sit back and say, we were basically working on timing. A lot of our work at the event was timing. So it was um, making sure that people were working in 45 minute blocks and had plenty of time for um, rest between these blocks. Day two started, ended with this awesome moment when basically we had all of these people simultaneously writing a readme at the same exact moment, we could sit back and just see all of these names scrolling across the Google Doc, and it was magical and wondrous. Um, and we kind of felt like we had facilitated the melding of this group mind into fruition. It was super cool. Um, and Ryan had mentioned our remote team of editors. And so there was actually, in the middle of day one and day two, a time when we turned our drafts over to the remote team which was awesome because the remote team was fresh eyes. They were able to basically give us tiny feedback but useful feedback between day one and day two, and we implemented that on the second day. So the first and second day looked pretty much the same, but in the middle there, there was this feedback point from remote editors, which was really great. So we did all that work and ended with this awesome readme mashing, mashup writing, and then, okay, we go home, and it's great, celebrate, we're home, except we're not done, because all the chapters weren't done, but we didn't expect them to be done. We knew that they wouldn't be complete, we just, we knew that they would be maybe three quarters of the way there. So the next little bit of our time was basically spent with the writers, finishing up their process, um, and then we turned it back over to the remote team for about two weeks, and they created this huge, amazing, huge bunch of comments and edits for us in these docs. Um, then it was basically our task as Open News to smooth those edits out, knit them all together so that it wasn't, instead of a crazy Google Doc mashup, it was something that could actually be presented on GitHub or, and on Read the Docs that a human could read and not feel like it all felt disjointed. So at this point, we're basically getting it ready for the public. And that's what we did. We <laughs> actually wove all those things together into one cohesive document, um, but it did have some holes. And those holes and those missing bits were not a problem because what we did was we made those into issues on GitHub so that now if someone wants to contribute, it's almost like an open door that they can just step in. There's little notes that say, add a checklist here or this is where we need more information about this particular um, topic. It needs to be more in depth. So that was when we started doing outreach and adoption um, was basically by inviting people to contribute. We made sure that there was um, a multiple, uh, multiple ways that people could become contributors to this document. One really cool way was we said, if anyone would like to translate this into another language, um, we we would welcome that, and someone is actually currently translating into Spanish, which is super awesome. Back to Ryan. Awesome. So yeah, that's the story of uh, the field guide to open source in the newsroom, um, a little bit about what's in it, but mostly the story about how we put it together. 
And um, hopefully we've shared some things that have given you ideas how you might be able to work with your own community and make something like it, to do something amazing together. Uh, like Lindsay was talking about, this project has gotten participation from our community way beyond what we'd imagine. Uh, we put some easy prompts on our contributors page, suggesting a few ways that people could dive in and start contributing, and people actually took us up on it. Um, we've had community members that we didn't even meet yet say, hey, I can translate this into Spanish. And so a Spanish translation of our field guide is like halfway done now. It's, it's, it's amazing. So I mentioned at the very beginning that we're really thrilled with how our project has come together. What we'd be even more thrilled to see happen is um, for people to take this event model and to make cool things with your own communities. So it takes work, but it's definitely something that you can do. You start with testing your idea with a few people you know, you start planning early, and you start with the basics. You communicate well, and you come up with an active facilitation plan, and then you set aside time for follow-up work. And then throughout that whole process, you think about the human beings who will be helping you out. So this is Lindsay, I'm Ryan, we're from Open News. We are happy to give away anything we know about doing this kind of work. So if you have questions, please come find us. Uh, let us help you. Thank you uh, so much for inviting us to write the doc. Thank you. Thank you.